All right. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome you to our latest meeting this week. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. One, we have a brief announcements period. Two, our speaker, Eaton McKeague, will then speak for up to an hour. Then we will have our question and answer period. And after our question and answer period, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where you can speak on and off subject about the uh, speech or off topic. And after that, uh, we generally close down about nine o'clock ish or so. But uh, we can also, you know, de determining what happens, uh, we may go a lot longer, but generally the meeting will stop, but the Zoom call will remain open until everybody has had their say and, and general discussion. All right, the College of Complexes consists of only two rules. One is one fool at a time, and two, no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, but uh, that's another story. <laughs> I'd, rather, I'd, I'd rather say my right honorable friend is a somewhat mixed up, better yet. Keep it, keep it the British way with their art of insults at the British House of Commons. One thing they're good at doing. All right, Charlie, if you're, you're ready for the announcements, I'll put the, uh, I'll go share screen and uh, be able to do it. Eden, I take it you want to, uh, you, you know how to share screen on Zoom, I take it, correct? Yeah, yeah. All right, the function's working, but we'll uh, make sure it works on this part. Um, all right, Charlie, start with your announcements. Okay, welcome to meeting number 3,628 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, first of all, I want to remind everyone that it's right at the top of our page there that we have a relatively new Google group uh, to which you are welcome to subscribe for upcoming notices of programs. Also, we maintain, which operates much the same way, a meetup group, uh, which at most you'll get one, maybe two notices a week, and there's no traffic on that regarding a description of upcoming program. Okay, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. Next week, September 14th, yours truly, Charles Paydock, will be looking, I've got a retrospective. This is called Big History. I looked at the life of an ordinary person and how it has changed over time. Yeah. Charlie, excuse me. with cavemen. It's not September 14th. Ancient world. It's August 14th. Uh, August 14th. You were wrong. August 18th. All right, August 18th. I begin with ancient world, go to Rome um, and the Middle Ages and go through the Renaissance, through the modern era. Uh, okay, it won't be terribly long, but I've got something of interest to everyone. I'm not limiting yet. Also, not just to the Western culture, but I'm taking a look at what was going on in Asia and elsewhere. But what was the, I just yeah, came to mind because yeah, a few years okay. ago, the theme of Congress was they said, we're going to watch out for the little guy. And I've always wanted to know who is the, what is the little guy and what's going on with him. All right. Um, on August the 21st, we're going to return to a discussion. <laughs> I see there's a mistake there. It should be the 21st. Uh, that will be an evening looking at uh, two poets on the topic of truth. Do you want truth or do you want beauty? And I attended this lecture. She's a visitor, Jean Lee. Miss Lee is a visitor from the other campus. And it's an excellent presentation, very interesting, and an excellent speaker. I, I recommend this program to everyone. Uh, she's also going to look at the topic of factoids uh, as a sundry issue. Anyhow, all right. On August the 28th, Tim Bolter says he's got a topic in preparation. So perhaps that date is no longer open, but I'll wait receipt of his. Tim, do you have any idea 
what you're mm -hmm. going to talk about? Probably going to be the revi revisiting of why uh, of nuclear power and why wind and solar won't cut it. But I'll have all a, right. Uh, so he's going to talk about green energy. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. and you're going to try to stop the Green New Deal, right? That's uh, ex excellent. Yes, stop the Green New Deal and get the true green carbon source, which is nuclear power. All right. Makes no Moving makes, on. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> In September, we're having our special Labor Day speaker. I had another public speaker, uh, a gentleman from the railway community, railway workers. Um, but Mark Burroughs will be returning. Uh, he knows a lot about the history of the organized labor movement. And he's gonna talk about our accomplishments and challenges past the present. So a good topic there on organized labor, the current status. Okay, on September the 11th, Jim Pfizer, who was the founder of the Academics for Truth, will be on the anniversary of 9-11. He's gonna talk about the topic of reality or illusion. I think every one of you at the college should ask yourselves, do you deal in reality or illusion? Okay, uh, on September the 18th, um, someone from Green America, which puts out an ecological publication, a nationwide organization, is gonna tell us all about uh, ecological their mission and vision and focus. So it should be an interesting evening. On the 25th, uh, the author will be returning. Uh, Michael uh, will be returning. He's getting together a book in which he toured around the United States at the height of the pandemic, interviewing very people. Uh, the next open dates, we have five, count them, five open dates in October. So if you'd like to speak to the college, there's information there on how to contact me. Okay, Tim, that's it. Okay, it I just away. wanna wanna point out too that our sister campus Dallas is now meeting on uh, Thursday nights. So if you don't get enough of them, you can join them on Thursday nights at six o'clock and they're having a speaker on August 5th. And Thursday they're open again for speakers. So if you have a talk in you now have two times to do it. They're meeting on a different night than we are because they are, you know, they, they, they thought the Saturday if it wasn't going as well as it could. Anyway, we'll be on Saturdays, but that's our sister campus. And uh, again, they're always looking for speakers and participants. So Thursdays, if you want to go down there, go ahead and do it. All right. And uh, that's all I've got. So uh, uh, well, I'd like to now have our speaker start coming up. And if you're ready, sir. Uh, we can get started on our on your presentation with uh, the work Eaton. Let's welcome Eaton McKee and his uh, presentation on world federalism. Hi, hello. Let me share my screen. Like I said, please mute if you can. Huh? Do you know this person? He's. Uh, do we know this person? Yes, we know him. Charlie does. I don't, but. Uh, He's from Berlin, Germany, speaking to us from Berlin tonight. So he's, uh, it's very late over there. It's about 1.15. So let's pull, give him our full attention. All right, I'm going to mute you, caller. You can press pound six to to uh, log in again at some point. But I'm just going to mute you because of the background noise. But uh, please, Eaton, go ahead. Okay. Great. Uh, well, it's great to have uh, to be here, and I appreciate it. Uh, I appreciate the invitation a lot. Um, yeah, like it was said, I, it is a bit late for me, so I apologize if I say the wrong thing or if I seem a bit droggy. Um, that's just the fact that that's what we're dealing with. Um, however, I'm still very happy to be here. Um, as yeah, a short introduction about myself, I am Eston McKeg. I am from Seattle in the United States, and I got my degree in global affairs from Western Washington University. And then I moved over to uh, Europe uh, to study political science at the University of Amsterdam. And that was before I came to uh, Berlin. 
Uh, and for about the last year, I've been the president of the Young World Federalists, uh, which is what I'm going to speak to you about today. Okay, so the Young World Federalists uh, advocate a new form of global governance, uh, one in which uh, humanity has a voice in global affairs, uh, specifically through uh, the institutions of a democratic world federation. Uh, so we were founded in 2019 and we are a political advocacy organization. Uh, and when we embody the historically broad support for world federalism by welcoming people from across, across the political spectrum, much like the College of Complexes uh, into our movement. Um, yeah, and it's a pretty old uh, movement. I understand that Charles was involved uh, for a long time back in the day. And I think that's really cool to, um, to see that. That's a very old movement with lots of organizations and history. Um, and we're proud to be part of it. Uh, so our vision um, is we envision a sustainable, just and peaceful world through a democratic world federation, a world run by humanity for humanity and providing equal opportunity to all on a thriving planet. Um, and these are embodied in our principles. Um, so the center principle here is uh, the core idea of world federalism. It's created democratic world federation empowered to serve the common interests of humanity. Um, connected to this core idea are four uh, issues that we relate to world federalism. And we believe that world federalism could help solve. Uh, there's issues outside of these four uh, and you can pick and choose your favorites. Um, so the first one there, abolish war, is essentially we argue for uh, world law to make uh, war uh, illegal and in enforcing the, that world law and also empowering international courts to settle disputes uh, between nations regardless of whether or not the nations uh, agree to the authority of those courts. Um, so world law and global justice uh, to end war. Uh, going down to, or just going across to go beyond the um, rocket ship. Um, so this is sort of, um, we have a lot of young people in our organization who are really inspired by uh, the recent space race. Uh, and they believe that a world federation, and I believe that a world federation could help uh, smooth this transition as we as we go into space uh, again. And so that's sort of, and then also um, making science and technology more freely avail available across borders. So ending scientific nationalism is embodied in that. And we believe a world federation would help with that. Um, and then just really quickly, these last two are fairly obvious um, with saving earth. Um, this is the climate crisis we find ourselves in and the crisis of biodiversity um, somehow uh, either through a world parliament by having climate democracy or through an, by making uh, ecocide and international crime, uh, there'd be ways to prevent the environmental uh, destruction that we find ourselves dealing with. Um, alongside that is protect humanity. And so this is like human rights and human rights law uh, essentially um, making it the sustainable development goals a reality through enforceable world law. Um, and all, and I, I could, we have a lot more information about these policy points uh, on our website. Each one of these is actually a campaign uh, where you can take action uh, today, uh, either through sending a letter or sharing something on social media, signing up, so on and so forth. Um, but uh, for the rest of the presentation, uh, or for the next few slides at least, I'm gonna focus really on the, on the core idea of world federalism in the middle. Um, so world federalism uh, is inherently a means of achieving a balance between unity and diversity uh, with a vertical separation of powers. Um, and so in a world federation, we believe that humanity itself or the human species would be sovereign. Um, however, uh, federalism allows for vertical separation. And I believe if you're in the United States, you're very much aware of what federalism means. We have a federal government and sovereign or semi-sovereign states. Um, okay. Uh, and then subsidiarity is the second principle. So decisions and responsibility should be distributed to the lowest level uh, as close to the people as possible. So not a strong centralized authoritarian government which dictates everything from the top down, but really a world federation that deals with only those issues that are global uh, with local issues being addressed at the local level and so on with the national level. 
um, which is connected to this following point that a world federation would not replace sovereign nations. Uh, national issues would still be solved at the national level, uh, which is an important thing to clarify when talking about global government. Um, and then lastly, on world federalism, uh, it would derive its legitimacy uh, both from the constituent nations and from the inherent global citizenship of all people in the world. Uh, and so uh, for world citizenship and global citizenship are often referred to in the abstract sense uh, sort of solidarity with people around the world and with different cultures and an understanding of different places. And we really argue for a, a, a real citizenship that gives you voting powers, rights and responsibilities, much like a uh, national citizenship today. Um, and so one of the main things that we debate amongst ourselves uh, is the, how do we get here? How do we achieve world federalism? And as an organization, we don't uh, take a, a very strong stance on this question. We openly support all of the pathways to world federalism. I have my own personal favorites. You may have your own personal favorite. However, we, uh, we realize that they all require uh, a mass movement, building of mass support for this idea. Uh, and that's sort of what unites these all together. Um, so just quickly running through them, United Nations reform, uh, either directly through reforming the UN Charter, essentially a, a global constitutional convention to draft a new charter for the UN uh, from the ground up, or with incremental uh, approaches like the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, which would be an advisory body to the General Assembly, uh, which could eventually one day turn into a fully democratic world parliament. Um, and there's lots of other um, ways to reform the United Nations to make it a little bit more inclusive and accountable. These are just a few ways to do it. Uh, another way that's uh, quite popular is the Union of Democracies. Uh, so sort of focusing on bringing the world's democracies together uh, because there might not be the incentive for authoritarian and autocratic countries to join World Federation. So we could start with the countries that are willing uh, to do so. Um, this is most, uh, this has the most traction, I think, with like the D10 group of countries, uh, which is uh, hosted by the Atlantic Council, um, as well as other kind of West uh, groups like NATO or the G20 and things like that and the G8. Um, another uh, very old pathway um, is to focus on regional integration. And so uh, a world federation could come about um, by starting with regional uh, regionalization and regional institutions. Obviously, the European Union stands out as the best example of this. However, uh, there are many other regional uh, regionalization projects going on around the world. Uh, my personal favorite one to see was the, the Continental African Free Trade Agreement, uh, which just happened a couple months ago, um, so which could lay the foundation for a, a, a stronger African Union. Uh, that was democratic for the whole continent. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, is a sort of grassroots world democracy. Um, there's a few organizations, actually many organizations, uh, trying to achieve this uh, through various means, either through uh, bringing representatives from different polities around the world to one location uh, to sort of be the People's, uh, people's uh, Council of Humanity, so to speak, uh, and then you all are a global assembly or a world assembly. And then you also have a lot of uh, people trying to use the internet and online technologies to create a global online democracy, uh, which would eventually become with enough users and the network effect become uh, legitimate in the eyes of, of governments. And, um, and we're actually a part of a, a, an initiative called the Global Democracy Initiative, uh, which includes many organizations uh, that believe in this idea. Okay, so the rest of the presentation pretty much just focuses on uh, us as an organization, our, our, our political advocacy strategy, how we achieve uh, and how we see ourselves in the movement. Um, so our core mission is to build support for world federalism. 
Um, and to do this, we educate the public and raise awareness. We collaborate with like-minded organizations and we mobilize activists and volunteers. A little bit more detailed. Um, so we focus on growing our membership. We have a paid membership as well as volunteers. And we have local chapter organizers around the world. Uh, I could start listing countries, but it is global in scope. Uh, and with about 10 chapters um, that are active, uh, which is really great to see. Um, and, but we, mo but we uh, in addition to that, we have like an online community uh, where our supporters and our members and our volunteers all interact and generally just have a good time, but also work on uh, the organization and building support for world federalism. Uh, and these are sort of our goals here. Um, we love to create a, a welcoming and inclusive environment for all people, regardless of ideology or gender or race or identity. Um, okay, and then alongside that, we're really focusing on action and I can get it, the last slide will cover this. Uh, I, there, I'll talk about the ways to get involved and what we have coming up. Um, but yeah, we've increased the pathways for people to take action. We have campaigns on our website where anybody can act. And we are also coordinating common actions with partner organizations. And we've even lobbied uh, a few politicians, most notably um, a US Senator. Um, and yeah, so we'd also like to increase the press coverage of world federalism. That starts uh, on our blog, as well as uh, press releases that we would like to send. Uh, two news outlets. Uh, however, that costs a lot of money, which touches on the other goals at the bottom. Um, increasing our online presence with ads and increasing our real world presence with chapters and posters and things like that. Uh, underlying all of these goals and strategies is the ne necessity of money. Uh, we're an all volunteer organization. Uh, and so, of course, you know, sending press releases or buying online ads and posters and helping. Uh, people in the global south getting you know a proper internet connection to be a part of a global uh, movement you know these things all cost money uh, and so that's where we have our fundraising goals and we have a store on our website so you can buy stuff with our logo on it and stickers um yeah and so this is uh this is uh, we're almost at the end of my very brief presentation um these are the things you can do if you're if you're interested. Our website is ywf.world, and from there you there there's a lot of information. There's a lot of information on the history of the movement and more academic resources. Um, so if you're really curious about a particular pathway of world federalism, or or how old the movement is and and the organizations that uh, preceded us and that we work with, there's a lot more information there. Um, our online community has over a thousand people. Um, we have, we're on all the social media platforms, our, but we focus most of the attention on Discord, um, which is a relatively new social media platform, but it offers a lot of customizability for us. So we run our organization there as well as interact with supporters and people who are skeptic. Um, yeah, and then lastly, and you can become a member or volunteer or a supporter. Um, yeah, and that's, I kind of already talked about that. And there's more information on the website uh, for all of these things. And I can even throw some links in the, uh, in the chat here. Okay, and the last thing, the last slide is what we have coming up in October. So we're working with a few other organizations, uh, the Democracy Without Borders uh, and Democracy Global in Argentina to host the Week for World Parliament. Uh, this is the eighth annual incarnation of this event. Uh, however, this is the first year that we've been involved. Um, the theme this year is share the vaccines. So it's obviously connected to the, to the coronavirus pandemic. We believe that uh, you know a, a world federation uh, with an empowered voice for humanity would be able to distribute the vaccines in a way that is equitable uh, and not only focused on the rich countries. Um, so that's sort of the theme. However, uh, yeah, and then but there's lots of more information about that on the website. On the website, and I would encourage you all to do this, and I can put the, just the link in the chat at the, after my presentation. We have an open letter for World Parliament. It just takes you 15 seconds to sign. Uh, and so that would be, I would love that. I would appreciate it a lot if you could go there and sign our open letter. Um, 
And then if you're really interested, uh, we can plan an event in your area or get in touch with someone uh, to help them plan or, or just participate. Uh, the website for this project can be found on our website, ywf.world, or you can go straight to worldparliamentnow.org. Uh, and that is my very brief uh, presentation. And I thank you very much for your time for listening. Okay, it's now a uh, question and answer time. It's Esten, right? Yes. I was saying even before. I'm looking over your uh, social media campaigns, and um, there's a couple of sites I haven't heard of yet. I'm, I'm from your from your website. Can you tell us a little bit about Discord and mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about? Uh, and we all know about Reddit, Twitter, and. Instagram, Facebook, and I do do believe some of them about LinkedIn, but specifically Discord, mm -hmm. Pinterest, VK.com, and Telegram. And I know you've got some good videos on YouTube. Yeah, of course. Um, so like I said, Discord, it's it's a bit like Reddit or, or a Facebook group. It's very similar to a Facebook group. Um, however, on a Facebook group, the main difference is that there's basically one forum uh, there's one page where you can post and chat. Uh, in Discord, it's separated into many different channels on the on the side, on the left side. So in one community, you can have simultaneous conversations up to like hundreds of conversations. And it also has other technical benefits like voice channel and video chat built in. Um, and so it's really easy to hop into a telephone call or a video call uh, just right there in Discord. Um, and then you have different roles and responsibilities, so you can restrict access to certain channels, uh, and that's how we basically run our organization, and we have a members-only section uh, all in one platform, uh, which is really handy for us. Uh, and, and one of the core benefits is that it's connected to other Discord servers, and uh, they're called so servers, but it's basically just a community. So our Discord community is uh, connected to others. And so we have a constant stream of people incoming uh, and saying, oh, I've never heard of this. This is really interesting. What is going on here? Or I hate this idea and I want to debate you about it. And uh, so then we're able to interact with the public in a way that a Facebook group doesn't necessarily uh, provide. And, and there's a lot of you can, I'd encourage you all to check it out. I can put the, the link in the description. And uh, the other question I has was on your Facebook channel that, uh, first one you did i mean on your youtube channel about the charlie chan speech mm -hmm. i mean sorry not the charlie chan the uh ah the, the one who did the ah, i'm sorry i'm forgetting it was the one where you used uh oh god i have it up here it was the uh one, one of the first one of the first ones you put up and that was about uh charlie chaplin yep the the dictator speech yes why did you choose to include that? That was there before I uh, got involved in the organization. Um, I think I could tell you a little bit about the founders. It was a, a young man from Australia and an even younger man uh, from Florida, uh, Nicholas Rowe, who was uh, 17 when he founded Young World Federalists. Uh, and I believe that he put that up there. Um, I, it's a famous speech. It's really popular on YouTube. Uh, but I, I also don't really see how it's very relevant to our organization, but at the same time, it does attract people, uh, to the, to our, to us just having it up there. So, yeah, I'm it's also, a good speech though. No, I know I've, I've listened to it before outside of your channel and I'm thinking it's very good. You also have views from Albert Einstein on there and, uh, others by like Walter Cronkite. I mean, have you watched all these videos on the, on the channel and, and comment on them if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've made a few, I made a few of the later videos, the, the Nina video, just about a minute long. Mm -hmm. I made the, uh, the organized the species one. That was my own political rant. Mm -hmm. um, the other ones uh, like the Albert Einstein, Albert Einstein speech was to a group of uh, young World Federalists. I, I believe they were called the, the World Federalists United or something. 
uh, in the United States. Uh, and it's a really lucky recording of Albert Einstein because he was going to go speak to those, those world federalists uh, in person. Uh, however, because of the weather, he wasn't able to travel. And so they just decided to broadcast him on the radio. And so his speech was preserved uh, because of that. Uh, and I tried to clean up the audio as much as I can. Uh, and it's a really great speech where he talks about the danger of Wait nuclear then. weapons. Even then, we have one planet. I'm sorry about that. I uh, was trying to post a link up to your YouTube channel in chat, and I inadvertently played. Uh, uh, that's my fault. So please forgive me for that slight interruption. No, you're good. No, you're good. I, I, that was pretty much it. I, I just liked it. I love the Einstein's, Einstein speech. I listened to it a bunch as I was cleaning up the audio. Well, that, that's good. Okay, uh, I'll open it up now to anybody else who has questions. Uh, it's now our question and answer time. But, um, you know, I've, I've often said, you know, uh, you, so you advocate that it's probably best like, to get done through the UN to get this world government going. I mean, yeah, that's that's one of the pathways. Uh, it probably has the most likelihood that, that a world federation would come out through a reformed uh, United Nations. Um, but I, I do stress that there's a lot of people working on these other um, ideas, particularly online democracy. Um, that's uh, There's hundreds of, of small groups of people uh, developing their own platforms or trying to um, use the current social media to basically create a, a, an online polity. Um, so that's, that's one way of, of bringing people together to at least discuss and debate global issues and vote on solutions um, in a way that would happen in a world parliament. Um, yeah, and then regionalization is, is essentially just taking place before our eyes. Um, so that's uh, like the European Union and other, other regional uh, unions. Um, so that's just uh, something that's happening and because of the global economy integration, but it's an economic integration, not a political one. So we really stress the importance of political integration. integration. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've had some others join us. So it's now question and answer time. Please uh, feel free to ask questions. Ellen, you look like you're chomping at the bit. So go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Charlie, okay. unless you... All right, Ellen and yeah. then Charlie. Okay, yeah, thanks. Are you talking about me? Uh, yes, Ellen. Okay, yeah. What, is there any connection to like the Federalist parties or Federalist society as we know it in America? Um, I, which I tend to be kind of a, what a the, you know, the judges and the, but it seems yeah. to be a divided power. I don't know, they're it's political. I, it hasn't had a good effect. Um, how do you compare to that? And would you say left wing, right wing? Um, is there any historical alignment on either side of that? Uh, we we have no affiliation with the with the Federalists that you that you speak of. I know of that organization, and uh, the existence of that uh, organization is actually why the the World Federalist um, Organization in the United States now goes by Citizens for Global Solutions. Uh, because they don't want to be associated in any way uh, with the Federalist Society. Um, so the term, uh, that's the, the tricky thing of a global movement is in some places the term makes a lot of sense, uh, but in other places it's, uh, there's been wars fought over uh, ideas of federalism and centralized government and things like that. Uh, so it's a, the term is actually a bit heavily charged. Um, so that's why we don't, I mean, that's the name of the organization, but things like, you know, human unity or global democracy, those also definitely encapsulate the idea that we advocate. <clears throat> okay, Charlie, you were gonna ask a question? Yeah, Easton, um, you use the term there, uh, enforceable world law. Are, are you talking about something like a uh, world law that everybody has to get vaccinated or wear a mask? Uh, I mean, that's those are examples of policies uh, that could be enacted I mean, by. Like that. No, that's a good idea. It, it, I really defer to a uh, to the world parliament. So for me, it's all about giving humanity a voice and empowering humanity and the and the human species to make these decisions for themselves. 
Um, and so if that is, our, if those are policies that the world parliament decides they want, then that's, then those should be enforceable. Um, but yeah. All right. Call, uh, caller, do you have, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the other end of the phone line there, the 847-745-232935 number. I forgot your name. Go ahead. You got a question. Go ahead. If you got a question, please uh, say something. I'm, I'm recognizing Hi. Hello. And I'm forgetting your name. I know I, I know we've talked before, but that's Jake. Jake, I'm sorry. Hi, Jake. Hi. Jake, I got a couple of questions. Um, so repeat your name again. Eston McKay. Eston McKay, okay. Um now where are you from originally? Seattle. All right. Yeah. This is this is the this is the Young World Federalist. Is that what you call it? Group. Yep. What is the relationship between the original original World Federalist Association? Uh, the World Federalist Association that's now known as Citizens for Global Solutions. That one. Oh, okay. So what? So what's the relationship between the two? We're we're close friends. I'm actually on the board of of that organization. Uh, okay. And we have a strong partnership. Okay. So do you have people in Chicago or is it more spread out? Uh, it's more spread out. I don't think, uh, I mean, we probably have a few supporters in Chicago, but we don't have any member active volunteer in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. Um, you want to have enough checks and balances in place so it doesn't become a world dictatorship. How would, in practical terms, how would you do that? Uh, well, very similar to that's a that's a big question, um, but it's uh, basically looking at uh, the beauty of the of the nation state system and the diversity of countries that we see around the world yeah. is we can sort of take what's good and what's and leave what's bad and, and design a system and uh, that works. Um, so we all are familiar with checks and balances between the branches of government in the U.S. So things like that, we could do a distributed executive. Uh, like right. Switzerland with five presidents. There's many different ideas. I think the underlying principle should be experimentalism and reflection and not ever assuming that uh, designing a world government or any government is a, is a final project and that it should always be reflected and, and evolve with time. Yeah. I mean, if you, if, you look, if you look what happened in Nazi Germany, Hitler was elected yep. through a complicated... It was a complicated political structure, but he was elected, and once he got in there, he just he he he, he uh, what's what's the word? Um, he he distorted the constitution or in order mm -hmm. in order to uh, increase his power. Mm -hmm. Put it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what was what's on a on a global level? What's what's to protect the system from that kind of takeover? Yeah, well, I mean, you can look at what Germany has instituted uh, after the fact to prevent that from ever happening again. So they have uh, a special court called the the court uh, constitutional protection court for Fassungsschutz, okay. uh, and that that court also has a um, uh, intelligence service uh, alongside of it called the constitutional protection agency, uh, which is wholly tasked with. Uh, uh, yeah, protecting the German constitution uh, and up to and including banning political parties uh, that are against democracy. Um, oh, okay. There's an excellent political case called um, the Communist Party of Germany versus the Federal Republic of Germany, which outlines uh, why the Communist Party was dissolved in Germany because it was anti-democratic and authoritarian. Um, uh -oh. So, I mean, you can sort of follow, follow those um, examples and say that maybe maybe institutions like that should be at the global level i see so there's a de democratic socialist party in, in 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 germany but the communist party was outlawed yes i mean the communists still remain and are active in a party now called the left um but that, that particular organization was outlawed yes yeah okay and lastly how do, how do you get how do you get in touch with you uh, uh, you can email me at contact at ywf.world. Uh, I think that's Why? in the chat. Yeah, I, he doesn't have access to the computer. He's on phone. Um, 
Oh, I can. Okay. So yeah, contact and then at YWF dot world. Dot world. Is there a, is an office or a phone number? Uh, we don't have a phone number, but our mailing address is uh, 5 Thomas Circle. 5 uh, Thomas Circle. Washington, D.C. Circle. Washington, D.C. And what is it? Uh, two, uh, 2005. 2005. Uh, okay. Spell your name for me again, quickly. Uh, e S T O N. E S G O N. Okay. S T. Okay. T T is in Tom in the middle. Oh T S John. Okay. Yeah. The last name is eleven letters, and it's a, it's going to be a, a, we're, we have a task here. Okay, so it's M C capital K E A. G U E McKeg McKeg. Okay. All right. All right, Jake, if would you mind, uh, I'm going to mute you again. Sure. I mean, there's still a lot of okay. uh, background noise. Okay. But if, like I said, feel Sorry. free to join it. No, no, no. Feel free to join Sorry. it. And... This, this is the air conditioner you're listening to. Yeah. And it, it, it's no problem, but, uh, you know, I'll just Sorry. mute you again and, uh, we'll, okay, uh, and then, I mean, you know, like I said, feel free to unmute and join it at any time, but, uh, Okay. All right. Just the amount of background noise coming. It's just no problem, Jake. Thanks for thanks for Sorry. the question. No, no. Okay. I'm right. very happy you're joining us. Okay. All right. Now, who's next on our call? Um. Uh, we had Ellen. We had Charlie. We had uh, Jake. Who else has a question? Bob Matter, Daniel, um, Margaret, Gillette. Anything you want to ask? All right. Um. You know, during oh, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. Who else has a question? After you, I, I would ask another one. This is Ellen. Um, just to follow up, I didn't you? I thought you said you were in Germany. Are you in Washington or Germany? Um, is this a Washington-based group, or um, can you clarify that? Yeah. So I, I myself, yeah, I'm, I'm in Berlin, Germany, and that's my home. Uh, the organization is a 501c3 that's registered in Delaware. Um, we're, we're a global all-volunteer organization, so we have no offices and we never plan to. Um, we'll probably just be remote workers, even if we could afford uh, staff. Um, so we use a Washington address because um, a few other, our, our partner organizations use that same address. So there's actually like three or four World Federalist organizations all using that same address. And there's someone there who checks the mail for us. And who are the partner organizations? The, the world, <clears throat> who are you yeah. partners? Mm -hmm. uh, there we have a whole list on the website under about us. Uh, the, the, the two that are involved in with this address would be Citizens for Global Solutions and then the uh, World Citizen Government. Okay. And when were, when was this whole thing founded originally or you know it sounds like it's a bunch of spin-offs in a way but um you mm -hmm. know what when was some of the the original what's your origin story <laughs> yeah yeah it's a great question um so as a political movement the idea of human unity is, is quite old um but the as a political movement it was uh the first organization was founded in 1937 um, I believe it was founded in, in Chicago, uh, and it was called the uh, World Constitution and Parliament Association, I believe. Uh, or no, it was actually called the, oh man, what was it? World Government, uh, man, I, I forget. What, I have to Google the name of the, the Rosica Schwimmer was the lady who founded it. Campaign for World Government, and she founded it with Lola Maverick Lloyd, and that was in 1937. However, that uh, organization um, uh, didn't really succeed uh, after World War II, or it became a part of a much larger, larger movement that was founded uh, in 1947. Um, so after the end of World War II, um, there was a, the largest push uh, for World Federation, um, which resulted in uh, Gary Davis, who was a former World War II uh, American bomber pilot, 
and he stormed the uh, first meetings of the UN General Assembly. And he said that this was a meeting of the world's governments and not the world's people. And he uh, said that he, he renounced his American citizenship and declared himself world citizen number one. Uh, and his story is, is quite interesting. And, and his, the organization that he founded uh, prints the world passports and is the world citizen government uh, in DC. Uh, alongside that was the World Federalist Movement, which essentially resulted in a big meeting of world federalists in Switzerland in 1947. Uh, in a city called Montreux, and they passed the declaration called the Montreux Declaration that essentially set the political uh, uh, directory direction, set the political direction for the movement. Uh, however, in that very first meeting, there was divisions. You had the European Federalists who said, you know, we need to have Europe come first and then the rest of the world. You had Earth Constitutionalists who said we need to just write a, an Earth Constitution and then eventually the, all of the countries of the world will follow this constitution. And then you had the sort of middle of the way uh, reformist uh, incrementalist group uh, that believes in institution building at the global level. Um, yeah, and so it's always been split from the beginning. Uh, however, the umbrella organization, the World Federalist Movement is the largest umbrella organization and we are an associate of them. Okay. <clears throat> and it said, like, say, you know, there's the communists, the socialists, the federalist, you know, um, you were anti-communist, would you say? I mean, you, you banned no. the communist, uh-huh. No, no, no anti-communist no. uh, or no, anti -communist. No, 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 we, we, we really don't. We're not left, right, or center. We, we're a single issue political advocacy organization. So we, we have a big tent. We accept everybody. We have communists and anarchists and liberals and conservatives we got it we have every political stripe in our organization um the thing that unites us all is a dedication to world federation world oh, federation Justin. sorry i've got a question okay um i don't view them very often but there's some very negative statements made on Fox News and I presume talk radio against the United Nations. And we also have here a Libertarian Party, which you're familiar with, mm -hmm. is vehemently opposed to government of any kind and most assuredly a world government. What are your candid views on these issues, this matter? Um, yeah, well, we try to, I mean, the job of a political advocacy organization is, is to make the, the idea and, the, and the, the goals that we want relatable and appealing to a diverse group of diverse amount of people. Um, so when it comes to you know, libertarians or I would sort of lump that in with, with nationalists. Um, that's where we do a lot of our focus on the subsidiarity and stressing that uh, sovereignty and, uh, and national authority would not be infringed. Uh, however, arguing for another layer of government, yes, goes against the principle of small government. However, we focus uh, strongly on recognizing the very difficult situation that we find ourselves in and the global problems that have gone unaddressed for decades and the failure of international treaties to address global problems. Uh, most notably the climate crisis and obviously the COVID pandemic. Um, so if you can uh, find some common ground with uh, unaddressed global problems, uh, and then you can maybe try to focus on uh, common solutions like World Federation. Uh, however, uh, our, our task, uh, if, we, if, we were, if we were tasked with trying to convert every libertarian or nationalist to world federalism, it would drain all of our resources immediately. Um, so we focus more on people who are susceptible or interested in the idea and want to get involved. Uh, nationalists who just want to disrupt and uh, even attack us, 
uh, it, like attacking privacy and putting, you know, things like that, uh, we, we have to, we, we don't necessarily welcome them into our movement. Very good. Yeah, attack privacy. What, what do you mean by that? Um, uh, we've had a few of our members, um, their names and local addresses have been sh shared, found and shared publicly. And so it's private information. It's called doxing, oh. disclosure of personal information. Uh, you were doxxed or by by an organization um, like anonymous or something where they uh, is that what you're saying or um, who who doxed you why do you know or well for the very similar reasons that Charles was talking about with people who are against this idea it was I believe a, a fat they openly were fascists they used fascist iconography like Nazi Germany iconography. Uh, and they didn't. They doxed one of our members who was openly World Federalist on on his like Instagram page. Um, so that's what that's what happened. Would they imply that you're like communist or that you're more communist than they are? A kind of fascist versus communist <laughs> conflict. Um, is that what they're saying, or what? What is their argument? What is the? I guess the oppositional dynamic there. Why? Um, I mean, to somehow smear you. What is what is their fake reason for docking you? <laughs> well, a world federation would in, we argue for sovereignty sharing between nations and essentially weakening the power of the nation state when it comes to global issues. So, if you're a nationalist, then you might not like that idea. Oh, so who are the like uh, <clears throat> like? a right winger in America or a right winger in Germany would not like it, the idea? Is that what you're saying? This Isn't that nationalism more? Um... Yeah, uh, I mean, we try to appeal to as many people as possible. And we do have people who identify as conservatives, as American conservatives in our movement and as supporters of world federalism. Uh, I think the key metric is how strongly do they feel about global issues and how you know and how far are they willing to go uh, to address global global challenges um but yeah yeah you're correct because i i have a hey ellen a, we have some okay, other people who want to ask questions okay. we mm -hmm. can come back to you a little later on bob matter please i know you hey over here hand raised for a while please go ahead i thought okay, he left He's here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bob. Unmute and ask a question. Bob, if you're there, unmute and ask a question. You have your hand raised. He was unmuted briefly. I yeah, he's muted now, but uh, I don't know if he. I don't know why. Um, um, let, let me. Okay, Bob, you're unmuted. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, so um. um under this world government, that would that mean there's no borders? Like, am I gonna go to sleep at night and then wake up in the morning and find a bunch of Lithuanians camping in my backyard? Uh, no, uh, we don't argue for that. We uh, we say that uh, you know a lot of these <laughs> a lot of these global issues should be solved by the by the world parliament. So I mean, this comes down to you would have your voice in the world parliament and if you didn't want um that to that, that to happen if you didn't want a bunch of lithuanians in your backyard you would have your say in the world parliament much like you do in the the u.s uh congress i assume so so uh, does not mean open borders no it does not uh no i mean you can even go so far as to say that the you know international migration crisis are are somewhat at least to a certain degree, caused by the international anarchy of the nation state system, uh, no, send, selling arms to Central America and things like that, and uh, disrupting uh, North Africa with, with war. Uh, you know, there's, you can actually pin a lot of the migration crisis on the, the nation state system and well, the sovereignty uh, of countries. Okay. Uh Still with me? 
Hello? Yeah, we're still here, Bob. We can hear you. We, we can hear you, Bob. Please talk a little louder. No, we can't. You're muted. Now you're muted. Did you did you have anything else you wanted to ask? Okay, Charlie, I think you wanted another question or not? Yeah, I, I'm a little concerned you allowed the personal attack against Lithuanians. I thought we had a rule about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, yes, um, the, there is about half of the people in the United States have bought into this Trump nationalism and isolationism. What in the world can we do to counter this myopic notion? I mean, is, is it, like you seem to dismiss it as not worth trying, but this is just incredible. These people are applauding you, closing the borders, getting out of, getting rid of treaties and not replacing them. Thinking it's not about ecological agreements. I mean, I granted the corrective measures are in place under the current administration, but these views are still, I think, given audience among a large segment of the population. Do you think they're gonna last forever or will they suddenly disappear with this nonsensical Trumpism? Yeah, it's a big it's a big question, and I obviously don't don't have all the answers to the to Trumpism. Um, I, I definitely think that it's worth uh, you know debating with these people and trying to find some common ground. Um, as a small all volunteer organization devoted to world federalism, that's not necessarily in our uh, mandate. Um, however, I I definitely believe it's a it's a noble cause. Um, from my perspective, yeah, again, focusing on uh, the severity of unaddressed global issues, um, the biodiversity crisis that's going to follow the climate crisis, um, the unaddressed inequality and rising power of corporations that are go untaxed. Uh, I mean, if you can, there's a long list of issues at the global level. level uh, and if you can somehow relate that to or find common ground based on some of these issues, uh, then you may be able to lead the conversation in a way that promotes uh, global solutions. Um, Jake, I came across an article. I came across an article from your sister organization, Citizens at Below, of for global solutions, and basically they're saying that because of the pandemic and the uh, climate catastrophe and the nuclear arms race and economic inequality, most of the public gravitas is towards a global solutions. I'll read from the article. A Pew Research Center poll in the summer of 2020 found that 80%, 81% of the 14,276 interviewed in 14 nations thought that countries around the world should act as part of a global community that works together to solve problems. Some 70%, 6% approved of the role of the United Nations in promoting human rights and 74% in promoting peace. While 63% the WA, the World Health Organization, has done a good job of handling the COVID-19 crisis. All right, uh, Bob, I know you have your hand up. Jake, I know you got another question, so please unmute and ask. Okay. Uh, what was I going to ask you? Yeah. Uh, how do you deal? How do you deal with the nuclear arms race? What's your answer there? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the nuclear arms race is actually one of the uh, the main issues that uh, spurred uh, the creation of the World Federalist Movement, uh, that speech we were talking about earlier by Albert Einstein speaking to the young World Federalists uh, in 1948, uh, it was largely all about the nuclear bomb. Uh, and so uh, thinkers like uh, Albert Einstein believed that the power uh, contained in an, in an atomic weapon should not be at the disposal of any one country. And he advocated yep. for a world government to uh, manage nuclear weapons. Interesting. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, uh, what was the other question I had? Um, yeah. Well, how do you reach the, the, it's called the Campaign for Global Solutions? Uh, citizens. Uh, citizens, yeah. GlobalSolutions.org. 
Oh, just globalsolutions.org. Okay. Yeah. They don't have an office. They don't have an office. They don't have an office. Oh, they do. Uh, it's in DC, I believe. Um, but they're also a bit distributed. Um, like their their executive directors in California. Uh, so they're, they're they're all over the country. Uh, but okay. they their official Thanks. office is in DC, yeah. And what's what you can Google it. What, uh, what's the website again? Worldsolutions.org. Global oh, Global Solutions. Sorry. Global Solutions. G L O Global Solutions.org. And do they have a do they have a phone there at the office or no? Um, Jake, why don't you go to their website? You can find all that information there. Oh, okay. All right. Um, it's, 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 it's quite an extensive website. I'm looking at it on my other computer now. All right, uh, Bob, did you have any more questions on it or not? Did you have your hand raised? All right. Like Evan has a question. All right, Evan, Evan, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to ask, uh, ask whether you have uh, think that young people are more amenable to thinking about world solutions than older people. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, the uh, many of our uh, we are a youth organization, and we have many uh, young people. We're mostly young people. I'm on the older end, at, at being 26. Uh, however, the the wider movement is is much older than us. Um, so you know, I'm, I, I'm friends with uh, people over in Citizens for Global Solutions, and you know, the average age over there is is maybe 60 or 70. Um, and that's just how that's many of the world's fabulous organizations are like that. So there is quite an intergenerational spirit um, to the movement. Yeah. I have a question. Where do you get most of your money? Do you have uh, big capitalist donators uh, or business interest? No, no, we'd have very little money. Mm -hmm. um we get most of our money from uh individual donors like our members and uh yeah and and other people who just give us what they can our, our largest don or our, our donations average around 50 dollars um but our members often our membership fees are one dollar a month or ten dollars a year um uh, so our, we we collect very little money to be honest we have very little money all right, no corporate interest uh, groups at all. No, right. no. And, um, I, so, well, here's the other question I had was, I am very concerned that I, I've done research that this vaccine is actually genetic engineering designed to keep you getting addicted to vaccines. And yet the whole world wants vaccines and seem to be about ready to impose them on us, um, which I could understand in the past with other vaccines, but not with this one. I mean, what, how, you know, if this was a, uh, a kind of bad vaccine, you know, kind of being pushed through propaganda, it would, it sounds to me is that world, you know, a federalist political advocacy group would be like, you know, just everybody takes it. it am I wrong? I hope. I hope I'm wrong, but it seems that the world is going toward, they're gonna make you get this vaccine, like a passport, which reminds me a lot of this movie. I just saw Cry Freedom about the way things were in Nazi Germany and South Africa with your passports. And I, I just think it that's my nightmare scenario of where we're going, a fascist world. And you, um, you know, how do you vaccine? stand on that? Okay. Do you honestly think the vaccine is addictive? Yeah, that's what the experts well, say. You that you have, it's like you making everybody take a flu shot every year. It's a great one. marketing campaign, but if they ma mandate it. People don't like mandates, and uh, especially if it's like the flu. And the the research indicates that taking the vaccine means you're more likely to get it. I think that's Ellen, what I've you know, observed. And, and this, and it, this. it actually gives you the disease, and then they go, but oh, and you need another and one. It's an Ellen, I think it's you're dead before, wrong. You know, by pharmaceutical companies that came out of Nazi Germany. So I, that's why I don't like political advocacy, and especially without free speech, when they say you can't talk about certain subjects either, as we have with, and Charles Paddock won't let me talk about the vaccine. 
So I, that's what really scares me. You get, you know, free speech that's not really free speech and political democracy that might People not be political going, democracy. You end up seat. like we have, we're All in right. 1948. Okay, All right. just a thought. Ellen, <laughs> let, uh, we, 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 I, I happen to know you're dead wrong on the vaccine issue, but that's another story. Well, if we can't uh, talk about it, how would you know? You know, we, we, you don't even want to hear the research. It's censored. Um. Well, like I said, 200,000 groups have been kicked off the Internet for saying anything about the vaccine. It's the Is one that word all? that can't be spoken Matter on the Internet. Not. Microsoft has total control. Um, Ellen, we'll, we'll be. OK. OK. Anyway, I, I thank you, Ellen. I, it's always good to have your input on this stuff. Um, can I can I respond maybe just shortly? I won't touch on that. All of it. Don't go right ahead, please. Go right ahead. We're still in a question session. Um, I would just stress the reality that there's a lot of people around the world who are still struggling with the effects of uh, unabated coronavirus and uh, are desperate for vaccines. The vaccine could give them coronavirus, and the world federalists won't let them, won't tell them that. It's banned from Spain. I have a question. Excuse me. I have a question. All right, Daniel, go ahead. All right. First of all, 97% of the people in the hospital are not vaccinated. So, and vaccination, vaccinated people are like 1% or 2% of the people in the hospital. Number three. It's still contagious. Why? <laughs> Um, uh, world Federalists have not made a, a World Federation Congress or Chamber of uh, People in the last 60 years. Do you think it'll take another 60 years before you get a World Congress? I'll mute and listen to your answer. I hope not. I, I hope it doesn't take that long. Um, I... Uh, I really hope not. We debate about the timelines quite a bit. Um, there's people who claim to be moderate and, and realistic and say, yes, I'm a world federalist, but it won't happen for the next 500 years. Uh, and then you have the other more radical end of the spectrum that says uh, the World Federation is going to happen next week. We just need to do, just need to ratify the Earth Constitution. Uh, and it's going to be any day now. Uh, okay. May I ask I, you another point is there? There's all kinds of international meetings. Every year of the child, the treat, they get all the, Evan would know all about those, more so than I. There's dozens of those. Mm. What do you mean, nothing in 60 years? Well, like a world parliament. I think what he was talking about was like a world they parliament. Had all kinds of those. Yeah. Can I ask a question here? Yes, go ahead, Jake. Uh, it's really, a, it's really a comment from previous speaker. Um, if you look what happened with, part of the problem is if you look what happened with the um, uh, polio vaccine, that took about 20 years to develop, and there were some there were some flaws in the process. There was well, I have a friend. Okay, the the, the well, the, the, just a comment that. The 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 the, 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 the All right, Jake. Okay, we got, sorry. We got the, no, no, we got it. Okay. We got it. We got a rebuttal okay. period for this, but uh, oh, okay, we, we, we appreciate um, wait, 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 Let me let me see if I got my question here. Uh, yeah. What what's your what's your solution what's your solution to um to the problem of um uh, uh global terrorism like what we've seen in the Middle East. Yeah, that's a great, that's a, that's an easy, I like that question. That's better than that. That's other stuff. Um, I would say that, uh, um, and it's, it's typically uh, an expansion of like the UN peacekeepers uh, to have a, yeah. a broadened role. Uh, and then, I mean, with terrorism, particularly addressing the underlying issues uh, that motivate people to become terrorists in the first place. Um, so that, that, you know, obviously a big part of it, but in terms of crime prevention, then, you know, fast, you know, instituting that through peacekeepers and things like that uh, is okay. how a World Federation would handle it. Okay. All right. Uh, we're all set, Jake. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to mute you again, if you don't mind. Uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll uh, over your hand, but 
We appreciate again. You. We appreciate the comments. So, uh, thanks again for participating. Who else has a question? Uh, Vicky. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, Vicky. I, I'm just curious how you like living in Berlin, and would you or even could you consider applying for citizenship? <laughs> I like it in Berlin. I uh, I like it in Europe overall, but Berlin is is uh, very nice, and the history here is fascinating, and um, there's a lot to learn. Um, Germany's become my home. I you know I'm married to a German, and uh, I have oh. a, I have a German family. Uh, I speak the language decently, um, so I, I I feel at home here. Um, what was your second question? But beyond Germany? Oh, sit, I was just oh, wondering how citizenship works there. Yeah. It's quite complicated. Um, they don't make it easy, just similar to the United States. Um, so I still don't have it yet, but I'm waiting for my permanent residency card. Uh, and that's a three-year residency card tied to my marriage. Um, mm -hmm. After that, I would be able to get a permanent residency card that's not tied to my marriage. Uh, and then I think for a, a period of eight to 10 years needs to pass and then I could apply for citizenship. However, because I'm a U.S. citizen and both my parents are Americans, I would have to renounce my U.S. citizenship uh, to take a German one. And that's because that's a U.S. rule, not a German rule. Mm. So you can't have dual citizenship then, right? I cannot because both of my parents are from the US. If one of my parents was from another country, then I could have dual citizenship of those two countries where my parents are from. So it, it all comes down to where your parents are from. Okay. Um, That's too bad though. Well, you know, but they, because I know you just recently had an influx of migration from Europe and uh, you've had some stability over there with your current prime minister. Uh, what are your present thoughts about the future of Germany and the world? And, and would uh, the young federalists have like a, like I know you got a, the European Union over there now, uh, would, the, would our world government look similar to a certain degree? Um, yeah, to, to answer your first question, Germany is going through, it's a big election year. Um, they're having elections in September uh and they are deciding a new chancellor so angela merkel mm -hmm. is going has decided to step down um and someone is going to take her place and it's a one of the biggest uh elections in uh, modern german history so the future is rather uncertain and it's a matter of much debate in the country right now um the young european federalists are uh another organization they're sort of our counterpart uh they're they're that's, but that's, they wouldn't probably frame it like that. They're much older and larger and more established than we are. Um, but in terms of the movements, the European Federalists and the young European Federalists are our counterpart. Uh, and they have always argued that uh, European um, integration offers a model for global integration. Okay. Jake, I know you got another question, so go ahead and ask. Uh, yeah. Well, why can't you have uh, dual citizenship? You just in the U.S. Said. Both my parents right. are from the U.S., yeah. But what, why, why is, is that German law or U.S. law? Oh, U.S. Law. law. Oh, so why, I mean, I don't understand why that would be a problem. Uh, oh, you're, say, you're saying that if one of your parents were German and the other were American, you could have dual citizenship? That's correct, yes. Oh, uh, 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 so that's by uh, U.S. law. Okay, okay. U.S. law. I'd like to ask, Israel is that, gives everybody. That, wait, 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 let me let me finish my question. Is that, is that, let me let me finish my question. Is that is that specific to Germany or what? Uh, no, I well, I don't know that. I've only really focused on hey, immigrating to Germany. About immigration. <laughs> I don't know. I know well, I'm that just, it's I'm just asking. asking. I, I I think it's yeah, a U.S. But rule. Speaking about the United Nations, Jake. Uh, don't interrupt me, please. Why? Charlie, don't interrupt me, please. Don't interrupt me. I, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, can I, can I finish my question, please? Is that specific to German, Germany or you don't know? Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. All right. It's, it's, all right. Thank uh, you. All right. I'm going to mute you again, Jake, if you don't mind. Okay. 
All right. Thanks, Jake. All right. Uh, who else? Okay, Charlie, you look like you were chomping at the bits. So go ahead and. Uh, you know, I, um, there was the environmentalist in the United States. This isn't entirely on the topic tonight, but the environmentalists in the United States were quite excited, I believe. This was several days in which the entire nation of Germany was powered by clean energy without such things as fossil fuels uh, whatsoever. Do you familiar with that? Uh, no, I'm not. When Do you know when it was? It was some time ago, but if you don't know, that's fine. Uh, yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know about that particular event, but I, I, I do know that um, oh, right. the German Green Party is, is contending for the chancellorship, and we might have a green, a green head of state or head of government, um, really? which would be of the first, yeah. In Germany, or in Germany, yeah, perhaps. I mean, she's on. Yeah. She's running against other people too, so I, you know, it's like I said, it's going to be one of the biggest elections they've had in their years. I've been watching the. Uh, the Deutsche Welle, which is a German news, uh, English news version. Uh, I'll put that website out because it's a, it's a pretty interesting one about what happens in Germany and how they're one of the largest part economic powers in the uh, European Union, you know, but it's it's been amazing how they've been able to, uh, under Angela Merkel, they've done pretty well. Um, all right. Yes, uh, Margaret, you got a question. I have a question, Esther, and you may not be able to answer or want to. I'm curious as to what your wife thinks about the upcoming election. Uh, what is her opinion? It's a good. Uh, yeah, so she she works in uh, in broadcasting here. So in, in that for national politics. So she uh, it's for her. It's it's a lot of work. Um, she's working six days a week now. Um, so it's, but she, she loves her job and she thinks it's very yeah. exciting and she's, um, she's leaning towards voting for the greens. Okay. Um, and what about child care? A quick question. You have children and no, we do not. Okay. Are there child here care care is great. What does Germany do about child care? It's such a huge problem in the United States. Berlin offers free kindergarten and uh you it, there's a minimum amount of money that your child is owed it's, but, and i know as a student as a university student so it's not necessarily child care but as a university student um there's a minimum amount of money that uh that that student uh is entitled to and they look at the finances of the parents to determine if the parents should provide that money or if the state should um but nonetheless the child is legally entitled to that to a certain amount of money every month. Uh, and so that's that's something, because I am I was a university student, so I knew more about that. Um, Childcare is really similar. There's a lot of benefits. It's a massive welfare state. And not doing too bad as an economic power either, right now, that's with welfare right. benefits. Mm -hmm. Much mm -hmm. like Sweden does in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, we could learn a few things from you guys over there sometimes, I think. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I think... Right, Ellen, yeah, you're, you're, go ahead, Ellen. You're, uh, I like your way of positioning it like what Germany did after World War II, you know, to address the, I guess, you know, the denazification of uh, Germany. Um, can, what else have you observed, you know, there in terms of what, how would you say it compares with inequality? Um, you know, how were there, I mean, just, at, also, one thing, I, it's surprising to me that freedom of speech, we don't really, we, I, I don't know if most people realize, but we can't really get, we don't get German news over here easily, I don't think. Um, you can get it over so here I, easily, Alan. Well, I, like easily. I tried to get, I don't think there's a lot of cross country uh, um, synthesis, like a UP yeah, yeah, that yeah. goes you know, universally, I, we all kind of maybe use just the New go, York Just time. go to the Deutsche Welle, they, the German news service. You get it all the time. It's right there on the internet. It's a click away. There's something different. We're cut off from German, uh, you know, people. No, I know I'm, 
there's something new. I don't know. There's a lot of ways to cut us off, but I guess I'm asking him, you know, for his opinion, like maybe the pros and the cons of the German system post World War II. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it, I, I, you know, it's not only just about World War II. Um, I mean, Germany was divided for 40 yeah. years after the war. Uh, so I'd say the, the largest shift in governance occurred uh, with reunification. Uh, and in terms of inequality at that time, uh, I mean, you basically had Eastern, the state, uh, the, the German Democratic Republic, the state just ceased to exist. And all of the national companies were bought up and many people were unemployed. Uh, so what you saw was a, a lot of people experiencing unemployment and homelessness in a country, the East Germany, which had none of those things before. Everyone was guaranteed a house and guaranteed job. And now all of a sudden, many people were homeless and unemployed. Uh, and so what the German federal government, the reunified federal government did uh, was institute a 5% solidarity tax on every citizen from West Germany. Uh, and that money went to directly pay for, uh, you know, infrastructure jobs and care uh, for the East Germans. Um, and that was, so that was a direct East to West 5% tax on all incomes. Uh, since that time, the tax still exists, but it's not just limited to East and West. Now the money goes to the poor and uh, in need regions all around the country. Hey, Would you up. say their system is better than ours? Uh, I, I, I don't think our welfare system's getting funded the way it used to be before the neoconservative, neoliberal uh, revolution <laughs> movement took over. Uh, how would you say the two compare in terms of the welfare system working? Yeah, to really? I, I, I really think I, I like it a lot. Uh, and I, I previously lived in the Netherlands for 18 months before this, and the Netherlands also has a really incredible uh, welfare state um, with super high taxes on everybody. Um, it's almost impossible to, to be super wealthy in the Netherlands. It's, it's actually shunned and frowned upon. Uh, so there's an interesting uh, culture that underlies this. Uh, in the US, there's a lot of glorification of, this, of the wealthy uh, and of capitalists. Uh, and you just don't necessarily see that over here so much. Um, it's way more of a collective, you know, I think one way to do it, one way to, to summarize it was that in, in Europe, uh, they often judge their society based on the, the lowest person, so to speak, or the, you know, the person with the least opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and in the US, it's, it's often judged based on the top. And we, we yeah, and that's the difference. Mm -hmm. It's encouraging. What? How do they stand with the Brexit? What did you think that was all about? Brexit versus the EU? Craziness and really sad. Um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't good, and uh, a lot of a lot of uh, tricky uh, messaging and communication went in, went into that, and getting that vote secured. Um, and Europe as a whole was very sad. A lot of people in Britain were very sad. Uh, but yeah, Germany, no one, no one had anything good to say about it. And there's not any animosity, really. It's just really sad because uh, they were a strong partner in the EU. And uh, yeah, but the, the union as a whole uh, did a lot of things to, uh, is trying to get stronger and, and maintain its current status. Um, but European politics is a, is a big topic and uh, there's lots of ins and outs and lots of developments every day. And so did you study over there in Germany? You went to college in Germany, is that right? Or yeah, I went to the University of Amsterdam and I got my master's in political science there. And, and that's in Germany? No, no, that's in Amsterdam, in Netherlands. Amsterdam. It's in I Netherlands, see. yeah. And then I moved okay. over here. Okay. And and to, the uh, United Nations from time to time issues global initiatives. I they believe they used to have a list of 10 global initiatives, like every child would get a cup of food to eat every day, 
and things like that, distributive agriculture. Um, is there any discussion these days of such things? I mean, I remember, was it G20 or something? The other side were talking with some great conspiracy. But are there any pending initiatives right now of interest? Well, the big one is the, the sustainable development goals. Uh, so those are like 16 goals that that uh, wrap up many of the initiatives and um, and and goals uh, for the world, including you know reducing inequality and addressing the climate crisis and and, and many many issues, uh, gender equality and, and and justice and it's it's 16 goals and they each have uh, many sub points. Um, I think the uh, and there's a lot of momentum uh, that was mobilized by those goals. So there's a ton of organizations out there um, devoted to reaching those goals and, and uh, trying to you know, make create impact and, and all of these things. Um, however, if, if you follow the, the progress on those goals, which were previously the Millennium Development Goals for the year 2000, uh, they oftentimes don't meet their targets. Uh, and some of them laughably so some of them it's actually getting worse as time goes on particularly with the with the climate crisis and things like that and migration which is only going up uh, and so uh, the goals aren't working and so that's as as world federalists we we don't believe that these sort of symbolic goals uh, between the governments of the world are actually going to help us address global challenges which is why we argue for enforceable world law uh, enacted through a world parliament that gives every person a voice on the global stage. Okay. All right. For many of you, okay, I'm just going to make the things. I put in the chat several of the German website for news. It's Deutsche Welle, DW.com, France, France24.com, Russia, which is RT.com, the Middle East, which is Al Jazeera.com, China gov.cn slash English. There's no way that you cannot get your news sources from another source because they're just a click well, away. That's actually there's, those there's are some American other, versions of those. There's things. some that's other there's some other places too. There are some cultural institutions. There's the Goethe Institute down mm -hmm. at Michigan and Randolph, where okay. that has classes and seminars. There's Dunkhaus, which is more of a social learning to cook and this kind of thing, German style up on Western Avenue. And I suspect there are many other German institutions here in Chicago, because there are a lot of people of German heritage. So if you wanted to get it, you could get, you could get, uh, you could get it that way. And I, I disagree. I think that uh, the Deutsche Welle is, is pretty objective. They are. And I'm yeah. sure Justin, you'd agree a lot of ways, wouldn't you? Yeah, I get my news from Deutsche Welle. And uh, cause I know I get a lot of times they I picked that them and NPR are a lot the same type of thing, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What, is your, what is your opinion of the BBC? Or do you get it over there pretty much? I mean, I, as a news source, it's it's fine. I I, uh, I guess it's connecting the BBC and NPR and, and and Deutsche Welle. Deutsche Welle is like the, it's the English branch of something called RRD, which is like the first German broadcaster. Mm -hmm. um, these are all developed uh, after the war, actually. The, those two public broadcasters in Germany that were uh, founded and designed by the United States military uh, after the war because uh, the propaganda machine of the Nazi party was so strong. So they instituted this form of public broadcasting that is uh, completely and entirely independent um, from the government. Wow. Uh, how, however, it's funded uh, per household and per person 17 euros a month. So including me, I pay money into this institution. So it's uh, it's they're both a very strong public broadcaster with lots of in their what they have to program is decided by law, uh, lots of educational stuff, lots of educate uh, po political coverage and so on, um, including entertainment. So these institutions actually produce some of the most popular movies and TV in Germany. Wow, uh, I, I, I so didn't I, know this. Yeah, it's really fascinating. It's, it's extremely fascinating because it was uh, designed so deliberately. It wasn't just sort of accident or th organically it was really designed deliberately and built after the war uh, so they have the the governance of it is actually a council of uh, sort of i call it the council of elders but it's essentially like religious leaders 
social leaders, uh, some political leaders, um, but uh, the the high top level governance of the public broadcaster is uh, is 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 yeah a group of people who have nothing to do with with the government. Um, so it's it's really interesting. All right, Joseph, you got a question? Go ahead and uh, unmute and ask. Oh, uh, thanks, Tim. Um, right, hello, Eastern. Hello. Uh, you look quite young for this uh, circuit here. Uh, my apologies. I came quite late and uh, missed the early part of your uh, presentation. Um, my question is in line with what uh, Charles asked earlier. Uh, World Federation, and you also uh, said democratic. How mm -hmm. and when this can happen in your estimation? Um, the second part of the question would be, uh, this is a unique term, World F Federation. So it implies that there is uh, uh, nation states which would, would be affiliated to uh, a certain center apex. And uh, how would the apex look like? Would it be a government uh, similar to uh, the ones contemporaneous or something entirely different? Um, thank you. Uh, those are good questions. I, uh, before I get into it, I, I'll just, I'll link to our website. We have a whole page on world federalism that goes over the basics and the pathways, um, the potential pathways to getting there. Um, my own personal uh, favorite of the many different pathways that we support is um, either UN reform uh, through like charter review or the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly or through something completely outside of the UN uh, with like grassroots world democracy or, or online democracy somehow becoming uh, democratically legitimate and authoritative. Um, in terms of timeline, uh, our friends over at Democracy Without Borders which run the um, campaign for the United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, they've produced a very detailed uh, theory of change uh, that relies on a few things to happen, but their timeline sees the, a world parliament being instituted uh, by the year 2045. Um, now, depending on how, depending on what type of world federalist you, may, you are, you may see that as too, uh, too fast or too slow. Uh, so what unites all of the pathways and strategies to achieving a world federation, in my mind, is that we need a mass movement to support it. Um, so whether or not it's charter review or regional integration or online democracy, uh, we need a mass movement. We did a critical mass of people involved and uh, active in the movement. Uh, and so that's where we come in and getting young people involved uh, and learning about these ideas. And your second question was about, um, oh, the APEC, what would the center of it look like? Okay, yeah. Um, it depends on how we get there. So that, that again is very much tied up in, in the pathway type question. So if, it's, if we get to a World Federation via the United Nations, then the center of the World Federation will probably look a lot like the, like the United Nations. Um, but if we get to a World Federation from, from, from an online democratic platform, which 7 billion people are voting and debating on, uh, then it's anyone's guess uh, what the World Federation could look like. Um, there is a very detailed um, outline of a potential uh, world government uh, from our friends at the Earth Constitution Institute. Uh, and I can put this in the chat as well. Um, this is not from our organization, it's from our, uh, a partner organization, but this is typically what I show to people when they ask for a very detailed elaboration of what a World Federation would look like. Thanks, Esten. Uh, just to follow up, um, yeah, I will go through uh, those uh, sources uh, you have provided. Um, is there a concerted movement um, 
already on or forthcoming and and in your estimate again um, I, i'm pushing you <laughs> when will the critical uh, mass uh, likely happen yeah um the movement does exist uh, it, it's not as large as it has been in the past after world war ii there was over 500,000 members of of the world federalist movement in the united states alone uh, and so it was it was quite a large uh, thing that had a lot of momentum as the united nations was getting founded uh, unfortunately due to the cold war uh, these ideas uh, just it didn't seem realistic at the time and many people moved on and 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 joined other things like um you know the campaign to to ban atomic weapons and things like that um i think that because of the advent of the internet and uh the increasing presence of unsolved and unaddressed global challenges uh things like the, like the youth movement uh for 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 climate the fridays for future led by greta thunberg uh, that shows that there is uh, a lot of young people concerned about global issues. Um, so I can't, I couldn't, I couldn't give you a timeline on when the critical mass of people would be there. I mean, I, it's my job to, to, to make it happen. So I don't, you know, hopefully it's next week, but uh, it's going to take some time. It's going to take a lot of outreach to um, external organizations and, and ideally bringing together many different groups of people. So, uh, you know, climate activists and social justice activists and people who, uh, you know, want to abolish nuclear weapons and, and war and people who want to have a controlled and managed uh, human uh, uh, presence in space, not just uh, rich guys with rockets, but a little bit more uh, equal and humane. Um, those, if we could get all these different groups of people together, um, that would be the ideal step to building a critical mass. Thank you, thank you. Hey, Jake, uh, one, you got another question? I'm sorry, Joseph, go ahead. One, one more, uh, I would say, last uh, follow-up here. Uh, you know, when you say world, world federation, you know, this world, uh, this is filled with uh, very diverse and heterogeneous creatures. You know, in their thinking, in their biases, uh, the strong, the weak, the privileged, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, in your experience so far, what are the uh, greatest um, uh, blockers or resistances uh, in your pathway? Um, I. I I'd say I don't want to like be too disparaging or. Um, anything like that but i would say that there's two main groups of, of people that uh that are the most uh, against world federalism and that would be the nationalists like we talked about before um so people who just don't uh, yeah who really love their country or 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 their believe in a strong uh national government above all else uh and then uh a second um surprising group for me are, are what I call multilateralists, or people who believe that international cooperation is uh, will solve global problems, and that we just need one more international treaty to solve climate change. Um, how you know? But I, that I just completely disagree with because um, that we've had lots of international treaties on climate change and other global issues, and national governments can just disregard them. Um, and so, but that is probably, so uh, coming, uh, addressing that, uh, that criticism or that opposition, who, those who believe that the United Nations is almost perfect as it is, and then those who believe that their nation is perfect as it is, uh, are probably the biggest oppositional forces we have to overcome. Okay, Jake, uh, go ahead and ask your question. You got your hand up again. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Joseph, thanks for contributing. Jake, go ahead. Jake, you got on mute if you got your hand up. Jake, did you have a question? Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even remember my question now. <laughs> okay, so you want me just to go ahead and, and, and uh, I'll take your hand down then, okay? Okay. And then I get, you know, 
There's still some background noise coming from you, so I'll just mute you. But okay. like I said, feel okay. free to unmute and uh, okay. join us when you All get right. a chance. Okay. All right. And thank you, Jake, for understanding about this stuff. All right. Uh, who else has yeah. a question? I have another question, Tim. Go ahead, Bob. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, this, this is more or less a question about Germany. Germany. I'm just question, uh, curious about uh, how they deal with public sector employee unions over there and if they are as uh, uncontrolled and wild as they are over here and we're running so many cities and states into into bankruptcy with their uh, runaway pensions and, and benefits and uh, and all that I just wondered if they if they got that tiger by the tail over there in Germany uh, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that to any to any strong degree. I, I, I could really just say that they uh, they do have strong public sector unions and that I, I do know that um, they have a, a certain term for someone who uh, it's like almost two classes of public sector employee. Um, and if you're in the top class, you, you're called a Beamte or which is basically an administrator. And so if you get this title of a Beamte, you, your job is completely secure and uh, your benefits are just insane. Um, uh, private health insurance and better pay and you can never be fired and all these things um, and a high pension. Um, so I do know that the public sector jobs here are highly desirable. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know much about the, how the unions relate. I know that there's lots of unions and, and for a lot of companies up after 500 people uh, or, or when an organization employs more than 500 people, they need to have something called a personal rot, which is like a human resources or an employee council, um, which offers as a counterweight uh, or a, an employee led counterweight to the board of directors. Um, so in a lot of ways, the employees are represented uh, stronger here in Germany. Uh, are, are the uh, public school teachers uh, unionized as well? I believe so. I, I would, I would, yeah, probably. Everyone's in a union here. There's a lot uh, more unions. And now one, one little question uh, back to world federalism. Uh, how do, in a, in a word, this utopian world federalist system, uh, what, what about currencies would countries remain, you know, would they keep their own individual currencies or would there be one world government currency or how would that work? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, we, on our Discord server or our online community, we actually ask that question uh, quite regularly because the debate is always is really interesting and, and nuanced. Um, I, I think that's something that would, that would happen gradually. Um, it, I mean, you can look at uh, currency unions you know, even today, you know, the euro isn't used in, in every country in the European Union. Uh, and yet, and then additionally, there are many countries whose currency is directly tied to the US dollar um, at, at, at fixed exchange rates. Uh, so in a lot of ways, there are sort of, uh, you know, currency unions that already are transnational or transcend national borders. Uh, so I, I guess looking at that and for examples to see, you know, what's good and what's bad. Um, but as an organization, the Young World Federalist doesn't necessarily, uh, we don't see much value in, in dictating exactly what a world federation would look like and what its power should be. Uh, we like, I, I personally and, and the organization likes to defer to the authority of a world parliament on those issues. Okay. Um, okay. Ernie, Ernie's got, I'm sorry, Bob, are you done? Uh, well, basically, I just had one, one more little dinky question because I'm like, just wondering what our speaker, uh, what his opinion is on cryptocurrency and if cryptocurrency, a wild thing like it is over here, is over in Germany, and is there kind of like a, you know, big, uh, you know, speculative bubble, everybody jumping in to buy cryptocurrencies over there? Uh, yeah, it's pretty popular. I know here in Berlin, I see the Bitcoin stickers everywhere. So someone went around and stuck up Bitcoin stickers on every street pole. Uh, so it is pretty popular here. And they have a big finance uh, sector here. You know, Frankfurt is more or less the capital of European finance. So 
Yeah, it's pretty popular. Okay, um, Ernie, you're next. Go ahead. Yeah, I just have a, a quick uh, a quick question uh, for our speaker. Uh, you said that there has to be an employee an employee rot or something like that, an organization mm -hmm. for employees. I thought that Germany had laws such that uh, uh, labor people had to be on the board of directors well represented. Is that mm. the case? And if so, what do they need this uh, employee rot for? Uh, I don't, you know, I'm really not. I'm still just an American who lives over here. So I, I, you know, I can only do my best job at answering all these detailed questions about Germany. Um, I, I've, you know, I've only lived in Germany for just over, just over, you know, 16 months now. Um, I know that they have the personnel or at like the employee council, uh, but I, you could be, you could be right that they also need to have employees on the board of directors. I, I'm just not certain. I know that they really treat companies of different sizes very differently. Uh, oh. So th the rules change dramatically based on how big and small your, your company is. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Jake, I know you got another question. Go ahead. Okay, I remember my question. Yeah, we were talking before about the German media. My question is, um, could you have an international media or an international newspaper that's set up in such a way that it's impartial, that it's impartial, that it's made as impartial as possible so that it gives you real news as opposed to propaganda? How would that work? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, I don't necessarily believe that I mean, I, in, in, in university, I, I definitely took the subjective uh, point of view when it came to when it came to knowledge and, and reality. Um, so I'm, I don't I personally don't even really believe in it, it, that uh, impartiality or objective truth is is, is possible. Um, so in that sense, no, as a, as a journalist, I, I, you know, no matter how hard you try, you can put in measures that offer a diversity of opinions. So having people who disagree with each other, um, but if you rely on one person to, or a group of people to put out the, the truth and call it the truth, uh, then you're, that's not, that's not the truth. Um, so I, I would put more, yeah. Jake, have you ever yeah. heard of the Associated Press or United Press yeah. National? UPI right. and AP are two of the international news organizations that consolidate okay. stories from everywhere. I'll put their websites up too in the chat. Yeah, yeah, those are great. Yeah, like Newswire is yeah. a great place yeah. to get right, news. Right, right. Yeah, I, I got I got a friend who who works for a, who works for Medill News. They're all over the world. And there's there's a lot a lot of different stuff. Okay, Jake, yeah. is that the end of your questions again? Yeah, yeah. Right, I'll I'll mute you again if you don't mind. All right. We appreciate all your 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 uh we we ask all your we all, we appreciate all your uh um in, input. Who else has a question on this thing? Um Joseph Kurian or uh Margaret, I know you're there. Um Ellen, you got anything else you want to contribute yeah. or Charlie? I wanted yeah, to ask about this space idea. That that to me sounds like a waste of money. I mean, I, do you really think that they're planning, you know, to send, you know, population to another planet. Um, is that something they seriously consider? It that sounds like only something a uh, a military group could come up with. I, you know, it just. Uh, what can you give me more background? Why people would actually want to send a democratic group to space? <laughs> Are you? Do you want to relocate? I'm not interested in relocating. No, I, I just. <laughs> um, I'll, yeah. I'll sponsor you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. I'll sponsor you. You want to move to the moon. Margaret, thanks for coming tonight, by the way. I do see your chat. Um, uh, I'm glad you've joined us tonight, and I know you got to leave, so... Uh, we appreciate you coming. And I'm looking forward to Jan again, J-I-A-N. She spoke to Dallas and she'll speak to us sometime in the next few weeks. And she's excellent. Recommend. Oh, I'm, gonna probably, uh -huh. 
I might be joining some of your sessions on Thursdays. Right. At the Dallas campus, but my normal Toastmasters meetings on Thursday nights. Oh, okay. Wait, aren't they on uh, Wednesday in Dallas, or did they already change yeah, Thursday? They moved to Thursday. Six. Really, already? Yeah, they. Uh, he starts Thursday at 6. He's on Zoom, and uh, I'll be joining. I may even speak there myself again. So, sure. But, uh, you know, he does a good job with the Dallas campus. All right, um, Ernie, you have any? Let's. I'm tr just trying to figure out if we should move to rebuttals real quick, or let's go. Let's go. The guy's tired. You know. Okay, Eston, thank <laughs> you. And what's going to happen is we're going to do a few short speeches here, and then you'll get the last word in on our thing. And uh, Eston, I really appreciate you coming tonight and staying up late. It's probably not about uh, three, four a.m. Right. Yeah, it's pretty late. I, I can respond to Ellen's question. I do want to give her a response to what she, to her Thank question. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll try to keep it brief, but I'll, I'll just say that, um, I mean, right, there's many people who are, or there's like these three billionaires who are trying to go to space right now. Uh, you probably have heard about that. Um, so what we argue for is that this is, you know, that's uh, basically like some sort of capitalist anarchy. Uh, in terms of who, what, what's the governance going to be for these people? And Elon Musk is saying, yes, we, he does want to colonize Mars. Uh, and he said that uh, he's even floated the idea of some sort of indentured servitude as a way to get there, where he, he pays for your ticket, but then you have to work for him on Mars. So uh, this sort of, uh, it's kind of a dystopian in my mind. So what we argue for is that this, you know, whatever, whatever we decide to do at space, uh, it will, first of all, it should respect human rights. And second of all, it, it should be uh, organized by uh, collective humanity. And that's, that's what we argue for. Mm -hmm. Do you think it connects to that they're just trying to get satellite? They're trying to do total population control by, you know, having all the satellites, you know, all the ability to censor the world. Um, I mean, that's what I think, I, you know, things, I don't think they really want to go to Mars myself, <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that is a scary idea because population control is, is not democratic, you know, but, uh, so it, it's more power to you on that. <laughs> How do you control people with a satellite? They, well, yeah, they have more, all the satellites, you know, if you control all the satellites, all the communication, all the information, all the knowledge, all the, you know, you can just shut down all the knowledge, dumb everybody down, put them all into servitude. And that's kind of the fourth Reich. As, uh, Ellen, the, as, thing, as the, the thing is about 90% of the world's information on the internet travels by transatlantic cable. And there's but no, it, they can do that. And then there's satellites too, which help around the world with phone calls and things like that. But still- well, the, If the you control the- the cables, you know, that's the thing. There really are only five mega companies that control all the media. And that, that we used to have rules, the Federal Communication Commission to break it up. You're not allowed to have a media monopoly, but basically they have a media monopoly now. And with the social media, it's like a total monopoly, which is how they're able to control the censorship of the V word that I, cannot I, be spoken. Well, the thing is, Ellen, yeah. I, I, I go around and if I want to find any virus rhetoric, I can find it real easy. I mean, you no, know, you can. Uh -huh. Our speaker coming up on the 11th, uh, September 11th, he's been definitely an anti vaxxer and uh, I think he's he's out there just like anything else. He's been censored bad time, big time. I'm yeah. glad you're having him, but uh, yeah. that's that not poor guy. Really not, okay, most people don't know about him. All mm -hmm. right. Um, Let's, uh, Joseph Kirian, uh, I'll, ask, I'll, ask, I'll ask you uh, one, more, one more question and then we'll go to rebuttal. So please go ahead, Joseph, and then we'll uh, start, go into rebuttals. Thanks, Tim. Because you called me out earlier, I thought I will ask one more. My apologies. And this question stems uh, out of my curiosity. Uh, as a young person, I read the main calf multiple times. And I believe, I believe there was a time when everybody there was inspired by Furor and uh, Nietzsche et al. So my question is, 
what is the state of the average German psyche today? Uh, are there remnants of uh, Nazism, fascism, etc.? Um, you probably want to just focus on the the easiest way to look at it um, is the process of the the difference of denazification in in the east and west. Uh, so in the Germany was divided in 1949, and uh, in the West, they had a fairly extensive denazification process um, that wasn't perfect, and they eventually gave up, um, but uh, they did you know, hold Nazis, former Nazis uh, accountable and, and put a lot of them on trial. Uh, in the East, in the Soviet-held uh, territories, um, they immediately declared that since the Soviets uh, had taken control, then fascism was destroyed and there were no more fascists in the country. Uh, and so they, the process of denazification is, was basically non-existent in Eastern Germany. Uh, and because of the, the dictatorship of the uh, Socialist Unity Party in East Germany, that wasn't, uh, you didn't see too many fascists um, during East Germany. However, right when the wall came down, uh, you started to see the appearance of the swastika as graffiti in East Germany, uh, which sort of shed light that uh, there, was, there was an underground fascist movement uh, the whole time. Uh, and now you see the, the far right party is uh, most popular in East Germany. And uh, so that essentially all stems from the fact that uh, there wasn't the extensive process of denazification like there was in West Germany. Okay. All right, at this thank point, you. all right, Joseph, thank you very much for your question. I'm gonna lower your hand real quick. Uh, and then we'll let's uh, get into a rebuttal period. Who's got rebuttals? All right, Ernie's got a rebuttal and Ellen, I know you got one. Charlie, you know you got one. Uh, what do you think about five minutes, everybody, for a rebuttal tonight? And that Eaton, Est, I'm sorry, Est, Eston, if you want to stick around, I understand if you're getting tired. Um, but after these brief rebuttals, we'll give you a uh, chance to respond and kind of take the last word, and then we'll come to close the meeting. All right, who wants to go first? All right, Ernie, go ahead. We'll give yeah, you I'm going to go first and be fairly short because unfortunately, uh, I'm, I'm not going to give a proper rebuttal since I unfortunately did not hear most of the talk, uh, although I know a little bit about the organization. Uh, and I'm hoping that maybe there'll be a recording out there soon that I could I could possibly see it. Probably be uh, up in a week. I would just make a couple comments. No, I don't know if anybody, uh, Esten, has told you, uh, we're, a, we're a very broad-minded group here. We have people with a lot of different persuasions. And one of our active members several years uh, ago was a fellow by the name of Germar Rudolph, who was from <laughs> German. Now, I don't know, I, most of got people here, I think maybe remember Germar. I remember. And Germar was on the lamb. Uh, first, he went on the lamb. Do you know what I mean by, yeah, you know what I mean by he went on the lamb from Germany because he was considered uh, uh, a Holocaust denier. OK, he did. He went around to the sites and he did chemical tests on the on the concrete and said, da, 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 this couldn't have happened this way, da, 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 da. He was a he was a smart guy. He had physics degrees and chemistry degrees and and was very analytical. And he gave some good presentations on totally different topics uh, during his time here, including the Kennedy assassination. And uh, well, anyway, he was on the lam from Germany to England. And he stayed there for a while. And then the English decided that, that they were, I think they decided they were going to send him back to Germany or something. And so he came to the United States and he stayed here for a while. He even got married and had a couple of kids in the hopes of being able to stay. But they grabbed him and took him back and he did a little bit of time in Germany. And now he's back in the States and I don't know what he's doing, but he was an interesting fellow. Speaking of Nazis, okay, there are some, so I, I, don't, I don't know that he was ever really a Nazi, but he was definitely a Holocaust denier. And about my my hometown, I come from a place called Williams Bay, Wisconsin, up by Lake Geneva. And I'm not proud of this, but there's a couple of well-known people 
that came from close by. Um, from Delavan, the nearest town, uh, Scott Walker, the governor of Wisconsin. He was from De he was from nine miles from where I grew up. And then a town even closer, Elkhorn, Wisconsin, there was a farmer who on his private land had built some kind of a monument to Adolf Hitler. Okay, I don't know where these people come from, but, and I never saw it, but I, I heard about it. And, and so, uh, you know, you, there's, there's still people who are, who are, who are into this. And there are probably more of them in the U.S. than anywhere because Germany apparently doesn't put up with them and England doesn't seem to put up with them. So where are they going to go? They're going to come here. And, uh, or if they're, if they're raised here, you know, they're, they're, you're allowed to pretty much say a lot of stuff if you're willing to put up with the uh, public backlash uh, of what you say. Anyway, I just wanted to throw those little comments in. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry I caught part of your talk and I wish I'd caught more because I think you're very knowledgeable and would have been very interesting. Thank you. Okay, who's next on the rebuttals? Ellen, you were gonna go? Okay, Ellen, you yeah, got Yeah, I guess I'm, I was just thinking, I'm interested in hearing more, I don't know if Charlie or, so there was this, Charlie, you were involved in this group uh, at one point, I'd be interested in getting your understanding of it, similar to the way Ernie seemed to think it was part of the College of Complexes. Is that, was there some overlap there? So could I, I ask a question of you, Charlie? He was just a speaker. And just he, a speaker. Okay, not not an long. active. He, uh, oh, he was an attendee. He published a skeptics magazine. He talked about the moon landing and Kennedy kind of stuff. That's it. I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I, yeah, I always speak. I'll give my, my five minutes. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, I, I have to say, like, I, I am basically, I guess, a skeptic and an anarchist. That's what my mentor taught me. Jesus was. And so I'm, I hold on to those two and whatever he taught me. But uh, I used to be um, more open to libertarian, neoliberal ideas, because that's what my stepfather was very um, embedded in, you know, and um, that was just the whole truth. And um, Ayn Rand, objectivism, uh, Milton Friedman, and, um, you know, I'm uh, kind of just without any real world context, you know, I'm a kid. Um, I, I was like believed everything they said and that, um, you know, my, my gut feeling before was I moved to New York when I was 10 was that John Kennedy, um, you know, ask not what your country does for you, ask what you do for your country. I, that would be my gut, you know, my grandmother believed that. We, that's what we kind of uh, fought for. And um, actually I have, I was thinking I'd have to put this in my memoirs that, that when I was five, I was, we had a little parade and they said, as long as I, you know, I could be the queen of the parade as long as I put Nixon buttons all over me. So I sold out early, but then my brother straightened me out. And I was like, how could I have done that? You know, but um, it's, I think you, what you know about an organization, I've learned, I study the deep state, the intelligence state, the, you know, the takeover of really a Nazi Gestapo police state that is what scares the crap out of me and I you know it's right-wing extremism and uh and then I was like okay great I've got it all figured out let's go progressive everybody will join me and I there's something about liberalism and this left-wing extremism or maybe it's just the what the right wing says about the left wing that <laughs> that is why um it seems like we can't come to any real solutions um I, I've been reading recently about uh, a very good book. Um, you know, the, well, one, Sherman Skolnick is very good, but also uh, this one, Nazi Hydra in America. You know, that really there has been, um, these are all the progressive press that Webster Tarpley and these people, 
and it, it just goes straight back to kind of the 30s and the 40s, the way the bankers uh, were funding Hitler. And um, but there's it's an invisible empire. And uh, at least to America, I think we've been completely misinformed. It's been covered up and whitewashed, uh, you know, that this is what really all of these books, bio warfare and terrorism, this one I have to say, Francis Boyle, we should get him to talk. He's the one that early on said that this is bio warfare, that this virus was made and the vaccine were both made in Fort Detrick, um, you know, Maryland at our Department of Defense, the, you know, we make biological warfare. There's atomic, biological, and chemical warfare. These are, you know, remember when they held up the little thing? Anthrax. And so, you know, anthrax vaccines, I've been, it's all hidden, all this, all this scientific information, but I'm digging into, I could only get an English study of, you know, why, what's the similarity between Gulf War syndrome and chronic fatigue syndrome and the COVID. And, and they're very similar, but the study said, especially if they got the vaccine for anthrax in the Gulf War and the, the stress, it's exactly like COVID, you know, it is. And they, that's why you got one third of the veterans going, uh-uh, you know, and, but this doesn't make it into the media. That's what I say about the problem with the media that, uh, you know, it is really a propaganda machine controlled by corporate interests and now, and the lobby and the most scary thing and about your group in Germany is the B and D, when you said that the intelligence agencies are right next to them, the B and D was Reinhard Gellin, who worked with Alan Dulles to create the CIA, and uh, he had more influence on world Nazism, the Fourth Reich, the strategy of tension, underground terrorism, and you know th there's just so many similarities, but it's impossible for citizen scientists and journalists to get this information out, especially when you know. The word V, uh, you know, I've been banned from LinkedIn for sharing a scientific argument to my not my library group. And they, as the best people, the Center for Global Research in Canada, they say, don't get mad at them. They can't help it. Poor journalists everywhere are not allowed to say anything. And um, but it's all controlled, even the German. And I, you know, I suspect you coming out of Washington, the World Federalist probably has something to to do with the CIA as a front group, but I can't prove it. So that's all I got. All right, who's got the next, mm -hmm. who's got the next rebuttal? All right, Charlie, you, you wanna go next? All right, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our speaker for staying up today and covering a multitude of topics. Uh, and also I appreciate the efforts that you are doing to institute improvements in world governments and improve the situation globally. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. There's an area called treaties and these are approved by the US Congress at any given time. I think not a lot of them, but they do come up from time to time. Rarely are they given any press coverage except for once in a great while. Nevertheless, they do occupy some time and affect the policies of the United States. And as someone who has to keep a, a track of legislation, I also come across these treaty activities, which at any given time, and I recommend everybody, if you have the occasion to look into these because they do have wide ranging effects well beyond. We hear maybe once in a while a, a, uh, the global treaty or the Iraq, Middle Eastern treaty, but there are certainly more than that. Uh, the thing that was not discussed at all tonight and which no one brought up was that the real threat to the people of the world is by the multinational corporations, which commenced organization in the early 70s. This capitalist exploitation 
exceeds very often the any government authority. It's very particularly smaller nations. And I believe everyone is aware of the, the extent that multinational corporations will go to drive profits and care nothing about exploitation of indigenous population and care nothing regarding about environmental degradation. If the young world federalists can do something to counter that, I applaud their efforts in every way. Uh, this capitalist exploitation is, is growing daily and with the decrease with international trade uh, on the increase is only a multiplying factor. All right, another thing is, and he listened to it, they're affiliated, which is called NGOs, non-government organizations. Citizens for Global Solutions is one of them, which I've been a member of for many years. Um, also, another one that comes to mind that occasionally has events here in Chicago is the UNA, the United Nations Association. There certainly are many others of them. I highly recommend that you join one or more of them. Very often, we the only thing we know, you're talking a lot about news, and with the exception perhaps of Tim, many Americans do not know that there is an international news. And also very Americans have very little cognizance of foreign affairs, which is what led me to do, to join these organizations, if anything, as a didactic activity to discipline myself to learn about and many, many things going on in other nations that have become about to attending events and activities of organizations such as the World Federalists. That's why I can recommend it as a learning process. And finally, I want to extend again an invitation to each and every one of you to come next week to hear me speak <laughs> about the ordinary man through the course of history yeah. If you have young people in your family, I would recommend inviting them to come and listen to it too, so that young people have exposure and perhaps inculcate some of the things that I have to say. Anyhow, thank you very much, Easton, and I enjoyed it very much. Keep up the good work, and I hope the best. If I can recruit uh, in Chicago, I may undertake to do that. Um, because I have some contacts here uh, and we'll try and do so. It sounds like an activity I might enjoy and it's very profitable. All right, take care and thank you. All right, anybody else have a rebuttal? Bob, you usually All have right. something. All right, I'll go. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll tell you, I'm deeply suspicious of this world federalism thing. Uh, to me, I just, I get a, I get a strong whiff of Marxism and collectivism and uh, authoritarianism from it and makes me nervous. Uh, you know, government exists for one thing and that is to protect our rights and nothing else. Uh, you know, I, I want to, I think, you know, we should have less government and not more government. And that's the, the least thing I want is more government. We got too much government as it is. I'd like to see us scale that back down considerably. Uh, and I got a feeling that with uh, with world government, what I could smell coming would be, you know, taking away our guns and uh, you know, you know, other things like that. Uh, again, it makes me very nervous. And then when you have one world government, where are you going to run to? You know, uh, your options are, you know, where can you, where can you flee to when you have one world government? And, you know, we already had little mini one world governments. We had the Soviet Union and all their satellites for years, and we see how that worked out. Um, <clears throat> so, so again, that, uh, that, that, that makes me nervous. And again, anytime you have a government, you know, that, that puts a drag on the economy. This has got to be funded somehow. 
and that pulls the productive resources uh, out. And so despite all the bashing of rich people of what they want to do with their own money, like Elon Musk and uh, Bezos and all those guys, uh, that what we need, if we want to improve the lot of civilization, is what we need is more free markets, more capitalism, and I think uh, less government. Uh, and that is what seems to lift, you know, people. Now, Germany is a strong country, but that is uh, in spite of all their welfare state and not as a result of it. And if, 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 uh, if, they, if they would uncouple themselves from that welfare state mentality, they would really be a force to be reckoned with. So, uh, no, I, I just get a whiff of a, this is too much like, uh, I see like Red China with their social credit system. I see that coming down the pike with all this vaccine stuff. And I can see the same thing happening under a world government where you'd have your, uh, you know, your, your, your world credit score and based on how, how good of a, of a, you know, uh, obeying citizen you were, you know, you would be granted uh, basically points and you get demerits if you did anything like, like, oh, exercising your free speech to, to uh, you know, uh, criticize the government or anything like that. Uh, so, no, nope, for me, it's a thumbs down <clears throat> on world government <clears throat> and a thumbs up on, uh, on uh, national, national governments, borders, uh, you know, gun rights, you know, freedom, personal uh, liberty, uh, you know, et cetera. More freedom, uh, less government, not the other way around. Okay. And that's Bob, Bob, how come corporations can cross borders, but people cannot? That's a good question. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, um, yeah. Well, if it's, a vol it's voluntary. I mean, I've got nothing wrong with. Uh, with people entering into voluntary contracts, I don't see anybody putting a gun up to somebody's head, making them go to work for Apple or, or uh, make them buy uh, Apple products or uh, Amazon products or whatever. It's all people are entering into a voluntary exchange, and I've got nothing uh, wrong with nothing. I see nothing wrong with that. Right, telling that to the Uyghurs who are making what I've seen, panels. What I've seen is uh, what we've seen around the globe is. Uh, well, really? a double standard, man. You, you have to All right. All right. Jake, you want yeah. to do your rebuttal? Yeah. Go ahead. It's time. Go yeah. Ahead. Okay. Uh, this is a comment. This is this is directed towards Ellen's comment. Um, basically, I'm looking. If you look, if you look at what happened with the, um, if you look at what happened with the um, uh, 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 polio vaccine, I believe that took about 20 years. 20 years to develop and there was mistakes along the way. I have a friend who, um, some of you may know him. I'm going to mention his name. He started walking around with a cane. I said, what's the cane about? He has post polio syndrome. What happened was when he was a kid, they gave him the wrong type of vaccine. So preventing polio, it gave it to him. There were like three or four batches from this one manufacturer that were, they were they were just done wrong. It was a live vaccine, and as soon as they realized them, it was a mistake. It, it 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 affected several thousand people. But as soon as they discovered the mistake, they they pulled it and they pulled that company's um they they pulled that company's uh, uh rights to to uh, uh produce the vaccine, and so. It, that was it. Only happened, as I said, it only happened with like three or four batches. But the point is, the polio vaccine took 20 years to roll out. Part of the hesitancy that I hear from some people is that this took less than a year to develop these vaccines, and so people have question have have I think legitimate uh, medical questions about their safety. Um, I uh, generally I'm opposed to imposing any kind of medical things on anybody. Um, but in this case, I'm not sure how I see this uh, the, the, because, because of the nature of the virus. Plus there are scientists who are saying with the, with the variants coming down, we may see this, we may see various variants coming down for a long time to come. And the only way to fight it is to get the vaccine out there. So I don't know how, I'm not sure how exactly I feel about it. I say I'm opposed to, I'm opposed to making a mandate for the vaccine, but we have to we have to find some other incentives to get people to do it. Um, 
Now, what's the topic it? tonight, Jake? What? It is no, that was the topic, topic tonight. Sure. Yeah, it has to do. It has to do. It has to do. It has to do with. It has to do with international control. So that's why I bring it up here. Um, been the other time, international com- control issue. Yeah. Okay, stop interrupting me, or I'll interrupt you. Okay, stop it. What? The, the, my, 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 Charlie, the let him speak. My, uh, my other comment was: this is the, the world federal. The, the other comment to Ellen was: this is not personal, but um, I seriously doubt that the world federalists have anything at all to do with the CIA. I had it's an old organization. I had a doctor once. Max Samter was his name. He was a German Jew. He came here to get away from Nazi Germany, I think in 1938. And he told me once, he, he, I ran into him once years ago at a meeting at the World Federalist uh, chapter here in Chicago. And he said to me, um, I, I've, been, uh, I've been a member of the World Federalist Association for 35 years. That gives an interesting perspective on it. Okay. Are you done, Jake? Yeah, I guess so for now. Okay, uh, Eston, let's, uh, unless there's any other rebuttals, you get the last word and uh, we'll stop the recording. Okay, I mean, I, I, I don't think I have it in me to get to go with, to respond to what everybody said. I can quickly say that, uh, yeah, we're not affiliated with the CIA and we don't plan to be. Um, <laughs> uh I would love, uh, Charles, if you want to like, uh, if, if you have any contacts or you're interested in uh, maybe hosting an event or doing something for the the, uh, the action week in October for, for World Parliament, we're, we're trying to get events uh, going on all around the world. We've got some in, in India and Kenya and Germany and New York, uh, Argentina. So we've, we've got some events lined up. Uh, and we'd love to see something in, in Chicago, obviously. So if, if you're interested in helping organize that, um, I'll throw uh, the information there in the um, in the chat. Uh, so that's the website, and you guys can all uh, sign the open letter for World Parliament. Um, obviously, yes, not everybody here would be willing to do that, but if you are, then uh, then go for it. And uh, yeah, and please be in touch if you're interested in uh, organizing an event. Uh, yeah. Um, when in October are you doing this? When in October? It's from the, the 21st of October to the 28th, and it centers around October 24th, which is the UN Day. What's the founding of the oh, UN? Oh, okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, can, can, you, can you contact me about it? I'll give you my information. Uh, yeah, if you want to write or say your email, I guess. Yeah. Okay. It's, this is not me. My email. This is a friend's email. I, I'm in contact with him all the time. It's t o n e z a p at yahoo dot com. Okay. And my name is Jake. Okay. Nice to meet you, Jake. All right. And I've got your contact information. Okay. All right. Cool. Okay. And I got a question for. Uh, I got a question for the moderator. Yes, Jake. You tell me your name again. Oh, Tim. That's yeah, right. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, uh, you, you, you're you're speak you're speaking on uh, the joys of nuclear reactors. Uh, I'll have a I'll have it up on online in the next day or two. When, so I, when, when is I, that? It's it's going to be in two weeks. I'm going to talk about why we need nuclear power and why renewables aren't going to cut it. Basically, I'm gonna okay. the first the first half is going to be why renewables won't do it. I'll probably uh, do, use most of my text from a text called Roadmap to Nowhere. And I'm also going to give a little bit of background about thorium reactors and then a little bit about why what what's he- heading forward and how that's the only way we're going to be able to stop climate change. Are you going to show some videos? I hope that they have terrible sound. I'll have some videos on it, but it'll be embedded in the PowerPoint. I mean, okay. yeah, that's usually required by you, you know, some well, video thing, that comes thing, across terrible. Charlie, I'll have video in my presentation because it'll be an integral part. But, uh, you know, they're not going to be long. Trust me, I'm going to usually mostly use my own dialogue. 
Why don't you translate what's in a video to your thought? We will be doing a lot of that, Charlie. Okay, but also be using pictures and other things. Okay, um, I'll have an I'll have an outline for you by Monday. Okay, um, it'll be it'll I'll have an outline for you by Monday. All right. At this point, I'm going to call the College of Complex adjourned, and I'll stop the recording.